Thank you, John. That was a, maybe the nicest introduction I've ever gotten. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I'm Lindsay Koshgarian. I run something called the National Priorities Project, um, which is now part of the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, National Priorities Project uh, started in 1983 during the Reagan buildup in military spending um, by four people in Western Massachusetts who were worried that they were losing funding for local needs like libraries and social programs and um, looked where the money was going, saw it was going to the military and we've been working on that ever since. Um, like John said, I started with National Priorities Project in 2014, so it's been 10 years. Um, and a very eventful 10 years, especially um, in foreign policy in the last couple of years, maybe even more so. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about uh, our country's budget and where our resources go um, and where they don't go and the various problems that are caused by our overinvestment in the military and underinvestment in human needs. Um, and this is what I work on all the time, and, uh, and this is what the National Priorities Project is all about. Um, so, and John came up with this very excellent title for my talk today, um, Military Industrialism and Its Discontents and What We Can Do About It. And so I, I appreciate that from, from John. And, uh, and you know, I've been, John and I have been in each other's inboxes for 10 years now, so it's kind of shocking that we haven't met in person yet, but um, it's... Yeah, but, but very, very glad to finally make acquaintance and to get to Portland. Um, so first of all, um, at National Priorities Project, um, we started concerned with the military budget, but especially over the last 10 years, it's become very apparent that it's not just the military itself. It's also the militarism in our country generally. And so that's more than the military and more than what we do outside of our own borders. That includes also what we do at our borders, um, which is increasingly militarized, and what we do inside our own country, which has always been militarized, to be fair. There's nothing new about that. Uh, but we've seen a lot of new developments over the last 10 years, um, you know, starting with the Black Lives Matter protests and continuing to this day. And so when we think about militarism at a National Priorities Project, all of those things are funded by our federal government. And so we think about all of those things. So the three big parts of US militarism are war in the military, borders, and prisons and policing. What was the third one? Prisons and policing, yeah. And that's it, they're all different funding channels, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And so then where is US militarism? And the answer, of course, is that it's everywhere. It's in our towns, it's in our cities, it's at our borders, and it is very much outside of our borders. So what you see here um, is a map uh, of all of the US military bases around the world. There are 750 military installations outside of the United States and another 4,000 some inside the United States. So if I showed you a map of the United States, it would also be pockmarked with bases and military installations everywhere. So on this map, the bigger circles are the bigger installations and the smaller circles are smaller. And you can see the big ones are places Italy, Germany, uh, Japan, South Korea, those are some of the biggest US military installations outside of the United States today. And they run our military operations everywhere. So our military operations in Afghanistan, for instance, were often run out of Germany. Um, so, and we've had these bases since we were at war in these places. They were mostly established after our world's wars. So German bases since World War II, uh, Korean and Japanese bases since World War II or the Korean War, um, all of these bases kind of where we've left our military as we've been in different places around the world. Um, and we still have them today and we're still using them in military conflicts today. Uh, so this is uh, a point I wanna make is, um, and I'm gonna show you kind of the details of this on the next slide, but of course in 2021, President Biden pulled 
the last US troops out of Afghanistan. And it was the end of the longest active military engagement in US history. It was also the first time on record that the US ended a major military engagement and didn't cut the military budget. After every other major conflict, and you can see here, there's a bump for Korea, the spending goes down. There's a bump for Vietnam, the spending goes down. There's a bump for the Cold War, wasn't actually a military conflict in the same sense, but still have looked very much like one, especially from the budget perspective. And the spending came back down. It didn't go back down to the same level. Then it goes way up for the 9-11 wars, the highest it had ever been since World War II. And then it came back down uh, after the peak of those, such as about 20, 2009 was the spending peak for those wars. Uh, and then you see it goes back up, but there's no dip after 2021. The spending just kept going up. There's a, there's a little small dip there, you see, but that's not even, <laughs> that's not even right after the Afghanistan withdrawal. So that the year after we withdrew from Afghanistan, we spent more than the year before when we had still been in Afghanistan. And I was personally uh, on a phone call with Catherine Hicks, who's now the Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, where myself and other activists and experts were um, talking about ways to cut back on military spending um, right at that time. Um, and we were told that there would be no savings from this war. So the peace dividend that is typically expected after a war did not materialize, and that's because the people in charge of the military budget wanted to reinvest in something else. And the thing they wanted to reinvest in was building up for a war with China, um, and to a lesser degree, building up for a potential war with Russia. And bear in mind, this was before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So this is what our discretionary budget looks like today. And I know that some of you know what this is because you've already used the word discretionary budget to me, a couple of you. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, the discretionary budget is the portion of the federal budget that Congress decides each year. So there are parts that are outside of this. Social Security and Medicare are the two biggest. Um, those are not included here. They don't get reallocated every year. They just kind of hum along as long as no major changes are made by Congress. So, but almost everything else the federal government does is up here. And so funding for public schools, funding for scientific research, funding for public health, for the CDC, funding for the Food and Drug Administration, funding for the Environmental Protection Agency, medical research, all of those things have to fit into this pie. And as you can see, the great portion of this pie is taken up by the military budget. 52% uh, in this year, which is fiscal year, we're in fiscal year 2024 and calendar year 2024. And this year, 52% of this budget is taken up by the military, which means, of course, that less than half is left over for everything else, for public schools, for uh, public health, for um, housing, affordable housing programs are a big part of this. Um, and then, of course, you can see another 8% is taken up by veterans benefits. And even though we wouldn't want to see veterans benefits cut, the reason that veterans benefits are such a big part of this is because we send so many people to war. We wouldn't have these costs for veterans benefits if we didn't send so many people to war. So when you put that together, you get to 60%. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, um, we also look at other parts of militarism in the federal budget. Um, so we're thinking about what we spend on the military and war. We're also thinking about what we spend on militarizing our borders. I'm not sure if I'm in the way of some people seeing the slides. Um, we're also looking at what we spend federally on prisons and policing and militarization of our communities. So this is actually going back a year because we haven't finished this analysis yet for the year we're in. But last year, um, all of those things together accounted for 62% of the, of the budget, which means that less than four in $10 were available for public schools and affordable housing and all of the other things that the federal government funds. 
Two foot. Bumps under international affairs. Uh, State Farm operation. Yes, I think it would be. The only part of the State Department that's not is, um, is foreign military aid, which is in the militarism portion. These are, so these are, this, these are um, fiscal year 2023 dollars. Um, all of the other dollar figures are in 2024 dollars. Okay, okay. Um, where does surplus on the national debt fit into that? Mm. Yeah, so I, I don't have that on any of these charts. Right. Um, I think it's currently at about 7% of total federal spending. Right. Um, and then this is another about 27 to 30 percent, right. and then the big part of it is actually Social Security and Medicare. Right. My understanding is that the military and military. The, yes. So typically, it's um, because there aren't separate funding streams, typically, when people allocate the debt, they allocate it kind of by percentage of what's been spent. And so, you know, if half of, and, and Social Security, and Medicare, of course, do have their own funding streams. So a lot of, yes, so a large portion of the debt comes from um, these things. There are different estimates of that. Costs of war at Brown University, which you mentioned, is a great source for this. Um, they do work on that. Um, in your listing budget, Border Patrol is within the military, or is it under some other big heading? So in this chart, it's within militarism. It's within? Yes. Yes. Yeah, on this chart. Um, and I'll get to what we spend on that um, in a little bit. Um, so when people estimate, but just back to that, the question on debt, um, when people estimate the portion of the debt service, every, payments on interest that are due every year that are due to um, mil the military, it's usually at about $100 billion a year. So it's a big addition to this. So what does all of this militarism cost us? Obviously, it costs a lot of money. You've seen numbers in the billions and trillions of dollars on, on the last charts. Um, but it also costs us our safety. Um, it costs us solidarity, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. And it costs us social programs. So to start with safety, Here are some examples of some of what's going on in the world today that is connected to US militarism. Um, of course, we've all, I think, been seeing in the news in the last few days before everything was overtaken with the Trump verdict, um, seeing the strike on Rafa um, and the finding that there were remnants of US-made bombs found. Um, at the site of the tent burning in Rafah. And of course, it's no big surprise. We know that the US has been supplying weapons to Israel um, the whole time during, during their assault on Gaza. And so, um, but this is one of the first times that there's, this is one of a limited number of times when there's been hard evidence um, that a US bomb was directly involved. Um, and then also this week, it's been a big week um, in the news. Also this week, Biden okayed for the first time Ukraine using U.S. munitions to strike across the border into Russia. And that was an allowance to use the munitions to strike Russian military sites that were attacking Ukraine. But it's still a big, a big symbolic step and a big, in some ways, an escalation um, of, of the war in Ukraine, and, uh, which is why Biden hadn't taken that step sooner, um, was because of the fear of escalation and the fear of how Russia would react or retaliate, which is still yet to be determined. Um, and then finally, um, you know, also in the news recently has been the uh, ICJ, International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court um, rulings with respect to Gaza, um, which have various called on, variously called on Israel not to invade Rafa and called for the arrest of leaders of Israel and Hamas. Um, and so the U.S. really you know, and the Biden administration in particular really relies on talking about the rules-based order. Um, this is a phrase they use often if you listen to Biden uh, administration diplomats and people. 
And the rules-based order should probably mean the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. Um, and so the fact that the reason the Biden administration isn't able to recognize these decisions from these international law institutions is because we're supplying weapons to Israel. And so our militarism is getting in the way of having an international order that is based on or rules and law uh, and diplomacy. Um, and so to that point, um, for every dollar that the US spends on diplomacy, we spend $16 on the military and war. Um, and so that's kind of explains itself. You, we, you get what you pay for. Um, and the US is paying an awful lot for the military and we're paying very little by comparison for diplomacy and the kind of negotiations that we would need to end current conflicts and to avoid future ones. Um, and of course, one of the, you know, I talked about the possibility of escalation in Ukraine and of course the big one that we're all concerned about is the possibility of nuclear escalation um, with Russia using a, a nuclear weapon. Um, and so this has been another area where our international diplomacy has fallen apart, thanks in very large part to the Trump administration, which ended up trashing several nuclear treaties that had been on the books um, with Russia. And I won't go into the details of that, but I do wanna show you our spending. Um, and for this particular spending, this is as far back as we have the record, back to 1975. But as you can see, the our spending on nuclear weapons now is the highest it's been on record since 1975 for the past 50 years. And, and it's on an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. What's it, what's it at right now? Uh, so it is, it's currently about uh, $33 billion for the weapons themselves, which is what this chart is showing. Um, but there's another about 35 to 40 billion that's in the Department of Defense for delivery systems. So those are the planes, the ships, um, the ways that, you know, that drop the bombs that um, are home to the intercontinental ballistic missiles and those things. Um, when they make more, do they ever throw any away? <laughs> um, the, yeah, they do decommission some, um, but there's a big effort underway right now to, um, to both make more and new kinds. Um, so lower, smaller nuclear weapons. Um, they call them tactical nuclear weapons, but they're just smaller. They're still many times, I think about 40 times as powerful as the largest conventional weapon. Um, so they're still completely terrifying. Um, and so uh, there's, there's an effort right now that's been over the last several administrations to reinvest in nuclear weapons. And so that means keeping the ones we have we need more, making new ones, um, and also reinvesting in the delivery systems. Um, and like I said, that's um, something that the Biden administration has very much been on board for and a part of, um, as were the last couple of administrations. Um, I will say that there is a document called Project 2025 from the Heritage Foundation, and it is what is considered the blueprint for a second Trump administration. So these are the things that a second Trump administration might be inclined to pursue or, or policies they might be inclined to, um, to enact. And it's written in large part by former Trump administration officials. So it's who are now, you know, obviously outside the administration, but were brought in to write parts of this plan. Um, and so that document, Project 25, calls for accelerating the spending on nuclear weapons even more, making more of them, um, making more ships for delivery systems, more jets, all of it. Um, and so they, they want to accelerate as fast as you can see the spending rising, they want it to go up even faster. Yes? Uh, it's my understanding they haven't passed an audit for what, 11, 12 years? Never. These They've never passed an audit. <laughs> accurate or are they not really more inflated than they are? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. These are all numbers for what's budgeted. So these are decisions made by Congress. Um, there is a separate, uh, you can also look at what's spent by the government. I would say these numbers are largely accurate. Um, a lot of the places where the Pentagon has failed its audit have to do with tracking its current um, inventory 
essentially. Um, so they're only able to account for about half of what they have already paid for. Um, this means you know, they're going around checking warehouses, looking for things and seeing how much they can account for, and they can only find about half of it. Um, so it doesn't mean they didn't spend the money. I think the accounting of how much money is spent is pretty good because it comes from the Treasury <laughs> Department, not from, um, or from the Office of Management and Budget, not from the Pentagon itself. Um, and the Pentagon only gets money through those avenues. So, um, so I think these are accurate, but it is also true that the Pentagon is the only major federal agency that has never passed an audit. And so this is just also showing our, this is our nuclear weapons spending compared to programs that, uh, of course, you know, this is all under the sort of banner of, of safety uh, and how these investments don't keep us safe. Um, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you that nuclear weapons aren't keeping us safe. Um, and so I'll just say, you know, this is to show you how much we're spending on nuclear weapons versus agencies that arguably do keep us safe. Um, so you can see nuclear weapons is about $33 billion, and this is um, from fiscal year 2023. The Environmental Protection Agency is less than $25 billion. The Federal Aviation Administration is just about $20 billion. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is only about $8 billion. Um, and the Food and Drug Administration is about four, three to four billion dollars. So very small expenses for these agencies that do very essential functions um, compared to nuclear weapons. Lindsay, is this particular chart up on your website? Uh, it's not, but I'd be happy to share, and this is eventually going to be on our website. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've got several charts here that you're the first to see, so. Um, Yes, yeah, food and drug, they have, yeah, those are kind of important, important ones. Um, and drugs is a huge, you know, could you, could you use a little bit more regulation? Um, you know, that's probably part of why we have an opioid crisis in this country is because we haven't done well at that. And then, of course, uh, another way that we're not safe is our troops are not safe. Um, <laughs> The sending them to war is obviously not safe. Um, we now spend triple um, to care for veterans compared to what we spent in 2001. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the growing number of veterans from the global war on terror and then post 9-11 wars. What do we call the line item budget that pays the military personnel? Uh, so there is a, there's actually, a, you just said it, there's a military personnel line item. There's a military personnel line item. Separate budget item. Yes, yeah. Um, and then there are actually uh, separate items for the Navy, for the, for the different services, for the Navy, for the Army, for the Air Force, um, for the Marines. They, they each have their own military personnel line items in the budget. Um, and, and I will also say that um, that's only about 20 to 25% of the budget of the military. Um, and versus, if you look at how much goes to contractors, it's about half. So this is like twice as much money going to contractors as going to troops. So how many soldiers are on the priority? I, 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 supplemental that actually is Ukrainian? Yes, this is a great question. Yes, all of, all of the figures include supplementals, um, which have been almost entirely to Ukraine recently, um, and any unfunded priorities that have been passed by Congress um, would all be included in these figures. And I am going to talk about the unfunded priorities lists in particular um, in a little bit. Um, so, and then of course there's this headline, um, which I don't know if folks saw that. These, this is an example of actually firing our own weapons is in causing traumatic brain injury to, to troops. Um, because the weapons are so big, they create a blast that actually, when it's repeated over and over and over again, actually injures the brains of, of the troops firing them. Really terrible. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, the other forms of militarism that I talked about. So 
Um, folks may have seen the story of the Los Angeles and California State Police um, tearing apart the student protest encampment at UCLA, um, which is where I got my master's degree. And so I was quite um, horrified to see those familiar places um, with the, the scenes that happened there. Um, also, uh, the militarization of our migration um, and the fact that people are being led to believe that uh, immigrants are a major source of crime in this country, which of course is not true. Um, and you know, just an example of what we've been seeing in the news repeatedly over the last 10 years or so, it's not anything new, but police violence uh, against um, people who are unarmed and uh, not committing any crimes. Um, so all of this is ongoing and all of it is funded at some level by our federal government. Um, militarization against immigrants is obviously the most obvious example because the federal government is, you know, they're the ones guarding the border, they're the ones de deporting people. Um, but there are also significant funds that go from the federal government to police departments and there are weapons that go directly from the Department of Defense to local law enforcement agencies through something called the 1033 program. And that number stands for a section of the law that it's written into. Um, and so when the Pentagon has surplus equipment, whether it be clothing, whether it be office printers, whether it be <laughs> um, armored trucks or rifles, um, and it used to include things like grenade launchers, they send that surplus equipment to local law enforcement agencies who can request it at no cost to them. Um, so they're actually, the Obama administration made them take back the grenade launchers, but before they did that, um, there was a community near me, West Springfield, Massachusetts, which is a nice little suburb of Springfield, um, fairly affluent, and their police department had a grenade launcher. So, um, so here's our spending on the, on the borders. So um, in 2023, we spent about $50 billion on the Department of Homeland Security and about half of that went to ICE and Customs and Border Protection. So those are the two agencies that are responsible. ICE does deportations. They're the ones who round people up from anywhere inside the country and deport them. Um, and then Customs and Border Protection are the ones who operate at the border. And so they're the, you know, the Border Patrol is at, at the border and along the border wall and detaining people as they try to come into the country. Um, but they're also allowed to operate anywhere that's 100 miles from the U.S. border. That includes all of Maine. I looked at the there you go. Yeah, it includes, it includes two-thirds of the U.S. population lives within 100 miles of a border. And so two-thirds of the U.S. population is under the jurisdiction of Customs and Border Protection. Um, ICE also has an Office of Firearms and Tactical Programs, um, which is a very, <laughs> this is essentially military training. Um, for their office, for their deportation officers. Um, and Border Patrol agents have um, military weapons like M4 rifles with silencers. Um, and why that's necessary for them at the border um, is, is, a, is a good question. Um, the Ho Department of Homeland Security also gets hand-me-downs from the Pentagon um, through this 1033 program where Pentagon surplus equipment can go to other law enforcement agencies. So they're all kind of connected. Oh, oh. Yeah, I think you stepped on Sorry about that. This is back on. This should come on in a few seconds. Oh, does this need to be turned back on? Looks like it's on. Just going to move that so I won't do that again. So the 1033 program, and hopefully this slide will come up soon, um, but this is, this is a program that's in law, Congress passed. Um, there has been a fight over it back and forth um, where for a long time it was transferring all kinds of equipment like the grenade launchers. The Obama administration put some limits on what kinds of um, equipment could be transferred and called back some of the, the most heavily militarized equipment like grenade launchers. And then the Trump administration, of course, lifted all of the, all of the restrictions that the Obama administration had put on. Um, 
okay. Okay, it's slow, yeah, here it comes. Um, and so overall, um, over the life of this program, the Pentagon has transferred $7 billion in military equipment to civilian law enforcement agencies. Um, and that includes, the most frequently transferred item is rifles. Um, there's lots, also lots of ammunition that's transferred, uh, but it also includes armored trucks, rifle sites, drones, and tactical gear. And so this is what you see police using frequently on the streets in response to protest. Um, that tends to be when the tactical gear um, comes out. So I mentioned the other thing that, uh, that this militarism costs us is solidarity. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that. Um, it, it tears us apart, right? It divides us. Um, it divides us politically. It contributes to the extreme division and polarization in the country. Um, it pits people against each other. It convinces people that someone else in this country is the bad guy. Um, so here are some examples of that. Um, one thing, and I mentioned that the big driving force for why military spending didn't go down at the end of the Afghanistan war um, was the military's insistence on preparing for war with China. And so there's been a lot of anti-China rhetoric from um, politicians in this country and certainly from military leaders. Uh, and that anti-China rhetoric also contributes to hate crimes against Asian Americans in this country. Um, not just Chinese Americans because a lot of folks can't tell the difference. And so anyone who's Asian American is plausibly being targeted. Um, and those hate crimes have increased since uh, China has been more part of the um, political discussion. And so this is an article from um, California where there are enough Asian people and people are aware enough of this enough that people caught on that politicians' anti-China rhetoric was causing an increase in hate crimes. Um, then, so this is a, this headline, the Biden wins main Democratic voters make statement. That statement was, of course, about Gaza. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Maine didn't have, uh, doesn't have a designated uncommitted option or similar to that for the primary, but people could write things in. Um, so that's what this article is talking about. So this is, this is a big thing, right? It is dividing the democratic base in a big way, um, the policies around, um, around Gaza. And it could be something that contributes to a second Trump administration. So that's another example of, of dividing us. Um, and then finally on immigration, which is a huge division point. Um, it's hard to find an issue where Democrats and Republicans disagree more um, than immigration. But so this headline is about a poll um, by Axios, which is uh, an inside, if you don't know it, it's a sort of an inside DC um, media outlet that's actually funded by the Koch organization. <laughs> But they did, a, uh, they did a poll, and also funded by many, many military contractors. They have lots of military contractor ads in Axios. But it is, very, it is a very watched media source within inside of Washington, DC. And so they did a poll saying that the majority of Americans were not opposed to mass deportations. Um, there are 11 million immigrants undocumented in this country. And many of them have been here for many years, if not decades, some of them since they were extremely small children. Um, and this is, of course, a Trump policy that um, would be to, to indicate mass deportations. The flip side of this is that there are also polls from around the same time that show that about two-thirds of Americans believe that immigration is good for the country. So we're very, we're very divided, we're very confused, but all of the rhetoric that you hear from the far right about crimes being committed by immigrants and things like this, which are in most part unfounded. Of course, you can always find a couple of examples, but um, largely unfounded are contributing to this kind of thinking that is really pulling communities apart um, and dividing us against each other. And finally, the, the cost against social programs. Um, so someone here mentioned whether uh, I was on TV and I said I'm not often, but this um, up in the corner you can see from MSNBC, this was a segment they did talking about a study of ours. Um, and so that study, in that study we found that in the 20 years post 
we spent $21 trillion on militarization, and that of that, $7 trillion was going to military contractors. Um, so a huge amount of money, right? This is like as much money as the US government spends in a year um, going to military contractors. And then those contractors got big bonuses during the height or <laughs> low point of the pandemic. Um, and they turned some of that money around and instead of using it as they were supposed to, to buy masks and pandemic equipment, they used it to buy jets, parts, and body armor. Um, so it was, this was a scandal. It was about a billion dollars, a huge amount of money to most federal agencies, not to the Pentagon. Um, and so this is just an example sort of of how funding militarism directly took away from our needs during the pandemic. Um, there's also this comparison that in 2020, Lockheed Martin, which is the biggest military contractor, got $75 billion in Pentagon contracts, um, which is more than the budget, the entire budget of the State Department. Um, and the CDC in 2020, their budget was only $16 billion. So here's another uh, example, um, public education, of course. Um, and school budgets are being cut around the country. And before I came here, I looked up to, and saw that um, Portland is no exception and is facing school budget cuts. Again, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there's a, um, my community also of Northampton, Massachusetts is also facing school budget cuts. Many, many communities around the country are facing school budget cuts. And one big part of this is because there was additional aid, federal aid going to public schools during the pandemic and that aid is now being called back. Um, so teachers are being laid off. Um, in, my, in my community especially, special education teachers are being laid off. Um, and in 2024, the Department of Education budget went down by $500 million, whereas the Pentagon budget went up by $27 billion. So cut for the Department of Education and a huge increase for the Pentagon. Um, and these numbers are all from our tax receipt, which we do every year before tax day. Um, and this is all to kind of say what the average taxpayer is individually contributing to each part of the federal budget. Um, so in 2023, the average taxpayer paid over $1,700 for military contractors, for the corporations, um, for the military industrial complex, if you will. And that's more than the average rent for a two bedroom apartment in this country. So very, very much money going to the Pentagon contractors. And again, that's about half of the overall Pentagon budget is going to the contractors um, versus just $516 for food stamps, um, which one in 10 people in this country depend on. Including members of the military. Including many military families, yeah. Um, the other thing about this, and I'll, I'm going to talk about this again in a little bit, but um, there's also right now the proposal from the House Agriculture Committee um, just came out for the budget for fiscal year 2025, and their proposal is to cut food stamps by $30 billion. Uh, another example, if you paid taxes, you likely paid $249 just to Lockheed Martin the single biggest Pentagon contractor versus $110 for the child's tax credit, which um, in its expansion during the pandemic cut child poverty in half. And that's, that's a, that expansion of that program has since been reversed. And so we've plunged millions of children back into poverty, but we're still giving Lockheed Martin a budget bigger than the State Department. Another example, the average taxpayer gave $110 for ICE and border enforcement um, versus just $14 for wildfire management. And of course, all of us know, um, did you all have the smoke here in Portland last summer? Yeah, all right. Um, it was pretty bad where I was um, from the wildfires last summer and likely some of us will be affected again this summer and every summer hereafter. Um, so, of course, this is a result of climate change and, you know, we should be investing more in both preventing climate change and in dealing with the effects of it. 
um, but we're only spending, you gave $14 for wildfire management um, that's supposed to help prevent the spread of wildfires as well as putting them out. And another one, um, you likely gave $87 to Boeing for its Pentagon contracts. It's in the top five Pentagon contractors versus just $23 for the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, and so if you think about Boeing, you probably remember um, from the news a few different things over the last few years. Um, one of the most recent was um, the plane opening up to the sky in midair. Um, there was also news after that where a whistleblower reported that the way they were assembling planes at Boeing involved um, people who were doing the assembly jumping on plane parts to bend the metal so that it would fit together correctly. Um, not something that I want to think about as I, if I'm on a plane. Um, and so $87 for Boeing versus just $23 for the Federal Aviation Administration, which should be regulating and overseeing Boeing construction of commercial air travel. And then finally, $12 for Pentagon and NASA contracts for SpaceX, which of course is Elon Musk's space travel company, um, and just $11 for energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. And, and this one is really terrifying, both because of the low number, $11 for renewable energy in the climate crisis. Um, and this doesn't include tax credits. So there is some additional federal money, especially after the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but this is how much the federal government is actually spending of its budget on renewable energy programs. And you're paying just $11 for that. And so you paid just as much as that to Elon Musk's space company. Um, notice that if we're only paying $11 in total renewable energy, that also means we're not paying more than that for Tesla. So Elon Musk is getting a lot over in the Pentagon area, uh, but not so much in the renewable energy and you know, um, electric car area. And so finally, I'm getting to what do we do about it? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, um, of course, the, the really big growing part of the protest movement lately has been around Gaza. And the calls in those protests and the student protests have been for divestment from weapons companies. Um, they have, you know, they have, students have been calling for their universities to call for a ceasefire. They've been calling for other things, but their main call has been for divestment. And divestment has been a big tool in the climate movement. Um, of, you know, students have done similar campaigns to get their campuses to divest from fossil fuel companies. But this is the first time there has been a lot of student action around divesting from weapons companies. And so I think this is a moment that we need to seize and take that divest energy and really urge, you know, support those students in their efforts to get their campuses to divest, but also think about where else we can divest from weapons companies. Um, you know, there can be city budgets can divest. Um, you know, certainly employer, if your employer or your family's employers or wherever you work has a retirement account, those, are, those can divest sometimes. So, um, so I think this is really exciting to me that there is a lot of energy around divesting from those companies because it really puts the blame where the blame belongs. Um, oops, let's see, there we go. Um, and some people, some of you have asked about unfunded priorities. And so another thing is there is an active campaign right now. Um, the unfunded priorities lists, for anyone who doesn't know, um, since 2017, the armed services individually have been legally required to give to Congress a list of items they would like that didn't make it into the official Pentagon budget. So they can ask for more ships, they can ask for more construction money, they can ask for whatever they want. Um, and this is fairly new. Again, I said only until, only since 2017 has this been legally required. And so there is a campaign underway to end that legal requirement. Um, and this year, those wish lists for things that the services want, 
that didn't make the official Pentagon budget account for $30 billion. And so if Congress chooses to grant those, which it has frequently, that would be a $30 billion boost to the Pentagon budget right there. And so we need to end that mechanism where the services are not just allowed, but actually required to give Congress a list of more things they want that cost more money, which Congress is then very inclined to grant. Um, and so there's a campaign to end this. Um, there is... Um, is it only the military? Yes, it is only the military. No other federal agency has this, has wish lists. Um, it is only the military that has a specific avenue directly to Congress to request more money above what the defense secretary himself has requested, right? So they're going, almost skipping over from lower ranks of the military over the defense secretary to go directly to Congress and ask for more money. Um, these lists are also kind of secret. People manage to get their hands on them, but they are hard to get. And so getting to this number of 30 billion took people weeks and weeks of trying to ferret out these different lists and figure out how much money was on them. So there's no transparency around the process either. Um, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has actually requested that Congress end this practice. And he's not the first defense secretary to say this. So even he's against it. Um, and so really there's, there's no reason why it shouldn't end except that key members of Congress want to see this continue. They want to see more money go to the Pentagon and they want to see more avenues for that money. Congressional to. We've got, a camp, we've got a vote again this year. So all of our elected officials are asking us for money. Yes. But they're getting money. They are getting money from the arms industry, yes. Yeah. Um, and especially, the, you know, uh, if you look at um, campaign contributions from the military industrial complex, they're really, yeah, they're concentrating their money on, you know, the chair of the armed services committee or strategic, it's not just, they do give to everyone in Congress, but they give far more to the people who are actually in a position to decide this. Somebody talks to them at the same time, but they know what, the recipient of the money knows what the votes they want. Yes, yes, yeah, it's, it's no secret. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's not at all mysterious, um, that part. And so there is a streamline the Pentagon Budgeting Act um, that's sponsored by Representative Pramila Jayapal, who represents Seattle um, and is the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, and so she has introduced the Stop Pentagon Budgeting Act um, that would, uh, I'm sorry, the Streamline Pentagon Budgeting Act that would, um, that would end the requirement for these wish lists. It doesn't even prohibit them, it just ends them as a requirement. Um, and so that's something that we can support. And there is a campaign underway um, for people to support this bill. Um, there is also, um, right now, uh, Congress is going through the process for the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the piece of legislation every year that sets military policy and the military budget. And there will be amendments um, introduced to that um, that will also end the legal requirement. And so one thing you can do is call your representative and request that they support any amendment or this bill um, to stop the requirement for unfunded priorities. And if they're hesitant, you can tell them it doesn't prohibit the wish list. It just says it's not a requirement. So it's just a small step. Um, Question. Yeah. What do you think their incentive was to create it? Why? The unfunded priorities yes. lists themselves? Um, it's something that's very popular uh, among military leaders of the services. Um, you know, they want as much money as they can get. Um, it's, uh, it's also popular among members of Congress. Um, so, you know, for example, if, um, you know, President Biden and Defense Secretary Austin have made some decisions about pieces of weaponry that are no longer serving the military well, um, and they may propose either ending the program or cutting back on it. The member of Congress where, you know, if it's, a, if it's a ship, wherever the ship is built, that member of Congress is not going to be happy. And so they, so members of Congress have um, a, sort of a motivation to give the lower level 
military leadership an opportunity to get that funding back, even if it's been decided at a higher strategic level that that's not something the military actually needs. Repairs to the Rockport Coast Guard office. There you go, a very specific example. So, so members of Congress are very invested in having a way to add money to the Pentagon budget where they want it, and this is one avenue for them to do that. Um, and the military leadership itself is also very invested in sort of having a way to go above the Secretary of Defense to get what they want. Um, so an, another, um, the, the final thing, I'm, a concrete thing I'm gonna say you can do is we work very closely with the Poor People's Campaign. And if you aren't familiar, um, the Poor People's Campaign was launched a few years ago on the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign. Um, and its mission is to end the injustices of poverty, racism, environmental degradation, and militarism. And uh, it's been going for several years, and this year they're having a march on Washington on June 29th, um, Saturday, June 29th in Washington. Um, they're, they're calling it a, a poor people's rally and march to the polls. So they're very much having their eye on getting out the vote. Um, this year and the election year. Um, and that's another thing. Uh, um, they're, they have organizations in, every, in almost every state. I believe there's one in Maine. Um, and, uh, and so they'll be traveling to DC for this march. Um, and they're one of the biggest movements outside of the peace movement itself that calls for military divestment or for cutting the military budget. So um, this is another good opportunity. Um, Something where I don't have a concrete action item to give you, but that I've brought up a couple of times and I just want to mention also, um, and there are things sort of in the works behind the scenes and we may have legislation to tell you about soon, hopefully, um, that you can support. Um, but we really need to counter the anti-China rhetoric um, in Washington. Um, this is, like I've said a couple of times, the big driving force for military spending right now. Um, is the idea that we need to counter China militarily. And there are many arguments for why that's not a good idea. Very quickly, they are, we already have a much bigger and more expensive military than China. Um, we spend about three times as much as China on our military. Any military leader will tell you that the US military is capable, is more capable than the Chinese military. And so the idea that they're some competitor that's catching up to us um, which is what military leadership will tell you, just doesn't have that much truth to it. Uh, another reason is because, of course, military buildup leads to military buildup. If we build up our military against China, they will do the same. That is how that works. Um, and so anything we do is going to be met by them. Um, so, we, so we shouldn't meet them. And third is... Whatever we do, China is also doing... If we, if we spend more on weaponry on ships, on things to counter China, China can see that and they will try to match it. So we will actually grow their military. We three are in this group and I remember, it was Kagan said, we don't usually meet with him, we usually meet with one of his aides, but this was probably three or four years ago. I don't remember all the details of who was saying what, but there was something about it and King said, Yes, yeah, that's, that's an argument you'll hear a lot, that China's Navy now has more ships than the United States Navy. It is true. Their ships are much smaller, much less capable. Their ships are not designed for World War III. They're designed for patrolling around their own borders. Um, and so it's just, it's a very misleading argument. They're not in this, yeah, I mean, I know, but it, plus I don't know how much, you know, he read that or somebody told him or, they all say it, or what, it's just it, what they use on people. It is literally true, and it is what they use on people, and it is what the military leadership tells Congress over and over and them. over again, because they want more ships. Um, but, you know, whereas, okay, China does have a few more ships, but they're very small, right. and, <laughs> and China only has two, and on its way to maybe three aircraft carriers, which are the big mm -hmm. ships, 
and the US has 11. So it's not, it's, it's all very misleading. Um, the thing I would say, it's, it's useful to know what some of those arguments against the ships are, um, but it's also just useful to make the argument that well, the more we chase so a bigger military, the more they will. Part of their argument. Yeah, and this is an, it's an arms race, right? Just like we, just like in the Cold War, the more one side does, the more the other side does. And we don't wanna get into that dynamic. We're already heading there, we're already in it, but we can reverse. Um, we, can, we can stop that dynamic. Um, and that's really, the only way we're really gonna cut back military spending is to um, win that argument. And like I said, unfortunately, I don't have a concrete action item for you today, but um, there is work happening in, behind the scenes to, um, for some progressive legislation on this, and hopefully I'll be able to share that soon. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna just end with, um, at our website, nationalpriorities.org, one of our most popular features is we have a calculator where you can pick an item on military spending. Um, actually, I'm just gonna pull it up live here for you. Um, oh, no, I'm not. Okay, we'll go back to this. So, but you can see over where the red circle is, oh, Um, you can you can pick um, your state, you can pick a city, county, or congressional district if you want. You can pick what you want to defund over there on the left. So this says military, um, but there's a, a menu there where you can choose different things that you might want to spend less on. And then over here, it will tell you, it, it goes on, there's a whole list of things. It, how many nurses we could hire, how many teachers we could hire, how many homes could be powered by solar power. And so this can be really useful when you talk to Senator King's staff or your representative. You can say, but this is costing us this much and we desperately need teachers and this could hire this many teachers. So it's, it's very useful.